Welcome back students. This is video lecture on chapter 11, parts A and B. The goal of this chapter is to tell you how communication, generally by the slower method, takes place within the body. A very important set of interactions that are sometimes difficult to understand because of all the complexity. But by breaking them down into individual systems, it makes it easier. We'll tackle these two sections in this video, the remaining in the second video. The body has two types of glands, endocrine glands and exocrine glands. While exocrine glands always secrete their contents along the duct, either to the outside or to a lumen, endocrine glands always secrete their chemicals into the interstitial fluid from where they make their way, if necessary, uh, into blood. Some combined facts about endocrine glands are presented here in this figure. As we just said, they are ductless, they don't have any ducts. Uh, their contents are normally secreted into the blood to be carried to distant parts of the body. Hormones are carried to target cells and only those having receptors for these hormones uh, will bind and activate. Many organs secrete hormones other than the ones that you think of, such as the heart, liver, kidneys and even adipose tissue. In fact, more recent research has suggested that nearly every cell in the body has some role in generating and releasing hormone-like chemicals. Neurohormones are a specialized feature of the hypothalamus and we'll see that later on in the second video. And finally, hormones help regulate body metabolism. They're involved in homeostasis and their response includes responses to the internal as well as the external environment. Further, they have roles in reproduction and at specific times growth of the body. Based on the light of this new evidence it makes sense to classify endocrine glands into two classes, major and minor. On this slide here we see the major endocrine glands. They include the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the pineal gland, the thyroid glands, the adrenal glands, the pancreas and the sexual reproductive structures male and female. Figure 11.2 does a fantastic job of relaying the functions of the individual glands. Students should consult this now for an overview and then come back to this figure once they've concluded reading this chapter. Turning our attention now to the hormones themselves, they fall into three discrete major classes. Now if you look carefully, you will see that these are very similar to the food molecules that our cells utilize. In fact, evolution is fantastic at taking things that already exist and then either using them directly, in some cases, or modifying them slightly so that they become more active as hormones. First two classes are directly related with uh, amino acids, either in individual form or in some type of uh, combination in polypeptides. The final class are lipids, and that's what students normally think of when they think of hormones as being fat-based. Focusing on amines in this slide, we see that most of them are derived from two of the 20 amino acids, tyrosine and tryptophan. This slide conveys a lot of information. The first thing it tells us is that in different tissues, the same amino acids can be converted to alternative forms of active hormones. And that, of course, depends on the gene activity of that particular tissue. So in the adrenal medulla, uh, tyrosine is converted to epinephrine and norepinephrine. In the thyroid gland, the same tyrosine will be converted to thyroid hormone. And likewise, in the pineal gland, uh, the tryptophan will be converted through a biochemical pathway into melatonin. The epinephrine and norepinephrine and the thyroid hormones, uh, because they're based on uh, tyrosine, uh, they have a very similar structure with a few modifications. These chemical modifications, they change the structure, the chemical blueprint of this uh, molecule, therefore enabling it to act as a hormone and not as an energy source inside all the cells. Some of these changes are extremely subtle. For instance, in the top panel here, we can see T3 and T4. Uh, this is T3 because it contains three iodines. This is T4. So the only difference is, is the absence or presence of this single iodine at this location. In the bottom half of the figure, we can see the difference between, between uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. And the molecule is just modified at the far side uh, with a few changes, and that's all it takes. Moving on to the next category, 
these are polypeptides or proteins. So polypeptides are normally any string of amino acids about 10 units long. Proteins will be longer than that. There's a whole host to choose from and we'll encounter them as we go through the two video lectures. But for now, just remember ADH, secreted by the posterior pituitary, that regulates potassium levels and water levels. Uh, the pancreas, in terms of insulin production, and the anterior pituitary, and the growth hormone is a great example there. Now these polypeptides or proteins can be modified by being tagged by other entities. So one of the most common ways of doing that is to put a sugar on top of your protein. So then now you have a long polypeptide bound to a carbohydrate. An example of that is a FSH and LH, luteinizing hormone. Peptide hormones are typically synthesized in one form and then modified before being released into the circulation. And a great example is presented here by a hormone such as insulin. During synthesis, a pre-pro-hormone insulin is made, then it's converted to a pro-hormone. Then prior to packaging, the pro-hormone is then converted to the hormone itself that's stored in vesicles and then released uh, when the signal arrives at these pancreatic cells to do so. At the molecular level, this is what the polypeptide looks like when it's first made as pro-insulin. Then it's cut and joined together by disulfide bonds, as you see here. So the blue area is cut out once the tertiary structure has enabled itself. This will be the insulin, and this will be the C-peptide that has a different function. In this slide, we see a slightly bigger list of these peptide protein and glycoprotein hormones. So now we have TSH, we have parathyroid hormone, ACTH, glucagon, oxytocin, and you can see the structure and where it's made and the effects that it has. It's a good idea to learn this table in some form so that it stays with you long term. Last class of hormones are the steroids and they all appear to be derived from a steroid known as cholesterol. We see the sex hormones and then we see something coming out of the adrenal cortex, uh, cortisol, uh, involved in stress responses. Looking at the structure, once again, there's a very similar core to all these steroid hormones because they're all based on this molecule here, cholesterol. So by rearranging the atoms around the frame of the cholesterol, we're able to synthesize alternative shapes of chemistry, which then have biological activity. The biochemical network is fascinating. Cholesterol is the raw material feeding this pathway, but the pathway has branches depending on the sex of the individual. And during that process, different substances are made that are biologically active, and depending on their concentration, uh, they can have different effects on that organism. There's no need to memorize the structure of the hormones at all, just to understand that they are related to each other in each class. The cells which synthesize steroid hormones do so by receiving input from external extracellular fluid or through the nervous system. And those signals then activate a signal transduction pathway that leads to the conversion of cholesterol to whatever that cell is capable of making, depending on which genes that cell has activated. A further classification of the activity of hormones is based on their ability to penetrate or not their target cells. So polar hormones are going to be water soluble in the plasma of the blood, but they cannot pass through the plasma membranes of any cells. So they must be either injected in as a drug or delivered there by other means. Examples of these, of course, are the polypeptides, the proteins, the glycoproteins, and some new names for you, catecholamines, uh, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. So these two are polar hormones. Therefore, they have to be delivered somehow across membranes or otherwise achieve their effects. And we'll see that in a few moments. The second class are the non-polar hormones. These will be insoluble in water and these are often called lipophilic hormones. Lipo means fat, 
hydrophilic means loving. And these can easily diffuse through the plasma membrane and enter a cell. And once inside the cell, they can then bind to a carrier, either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. A new hormone for you to contend with is melatonin. That is a non-polar hormone, very much similar to thyroid hormone. These can be taken orally in pill form or under the skin, and they will survive activity through the stomach. At one time, the adrenal gland was considered the master gland of the body, not so any longer. Regardless, you can see that it produces five different major classes of hormone from cholesterol. Again, there's no need to learn this relationship. Just understand that it can produce multiple types of hormones. The middle, or the medulla, produces epinephrine and norepinephrine. The cortex has multiple layers, three that have been identified to date, and each one is responsible for producing its own subset of hormones. So aldosterone is produced from the outermost layer of the cortex. The middle layer of the cortex produces cortisol and small amounts of androgens. And the innermost layer, adjacent to the, uh, the medulla, are producing androgens as well as small amounts of cortisol. So these two layers sort of piggyback each other. This layer is unique. In the gonads, cholesterol is once again the substrate, and that's converted in males to testosterone. And in females, they have an extra enzyme that takes these intermediaries and converts them into the female sex hormones, estradiol. Recall earlier that we said that hormones by the vast majority are produced and released into the blood supply to travel to their target destinations. We just understood that there are two classes of hormone, water soluble and water insoluble. So how do these two classes of hormone get transported? And the answer is by different means. Most peptides, not all but most, and all catecholamines are water soluble. So what we have to do is just screen these into the plasma and these hormones can easily dissolve in that medium and be carried to their destination. But lipid soluble hormones are very poor in solubility or not at all. And these have to be then packaged in alternative forms to be transported. Although some can be dissolved in small concentrations in the plasma as free hormones. Most are coupled in some form or way to plasma proteins. Regardless, we do know that only the free hormone devoid of its protein carrier is able to interact with the target cells. Somewhere along the pathway, the carrier proteins have to be disabled. Table 11.1 .1 does a fantastic job of taking information from previous cell biology chapters and concatenating it here in association with hormone types. So looking at the third column, uh, the location of the receptors, we just talked about that. These are going to be in the plasma membrane and these are going to be intracellular. How do these then continue the message through signal transduction using a whole host of signaling pathways that we have discovered previously? Where these are going to be receptors either in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. One other category of classification that's quite loose is that these types, the peptides and the catecholamines, they can be excreted fast and metabolized fast. So their effects can be pretty dramatic on the cell, um, taking place within minutes. Whereas steroid hormones can have the effects is exerted over multiple hours to days. In fact, we now understand a number of methods by which hormones can be deactivated or eliminated or destroyed. So imagine that you have hormones circulating in the blood again and again. So one way to reduce that concentration or to eliminate it completely is to excrete it in the urine of the feces. So once it leaves the body, it can no longer have an effect. A second mechanism that's quite common is to be inactivated by metabolism. So enzymes or something else can act on these hormones and convert them to something that's not active. The third possibility is not to remove them at all, but to allow them to proceed to their destination where they bind to the target cell. And at the target cell, they may be either destroyed at that location 
or released to be eliminated by either one of the other two mechanisms. There's one last category that we have to consider. That's the activation by metabolism. So once in the blood, other enzymes may be located on the endothelial cells of the blood vessels or the tissue can interact with that pre-hormone or pro-hormone and convert that to a metabolically active substance that then has its effect on the target cells. Thus, hormones have something known as a half-life, and that's the time required for the plasma concentration of any given hormone to be reduced by half. This can range over the whole plethora of hormones from a few minutes to even days, sometimes even weeks. The liver is primarily responsible for removing from the blood most hormones and converting them to other products which are not biologically active. But it's not alone. The kidneys can also remove some hormones as well as some other organs such as the lungs. Let's go back and talk about the pre-pro hormones and the pro-hormones. So pre-pro hormones are polypeptides with their signal leader sequences still intact. And these tell the machinery of the cell where that protein is to go. And in this case, because they're going to be excreted out of the cell, they normally end up in vesicles of some type. Pro-hormones have their signal sequences removed, and they normally are present in their final destination within the cell before delivery into the blood. But they still need some processing and some type of cutting of their polypeptide chain or addition of additional chemistry before they become fully formed hormones and biologically active. In the corner of this slide, we can see uh, these translocation channels that were spoken about in the cell biology component of the textbook. Several pro-hormones are listed in this table. So vitamin D3 is not the active form of vitamin D. It has to be converted to 1,2-dihydro vitamin D3. Testosterone is not the active form of that hormone, it's the pro-hormone. It has to be converted to DHT. And thyroxine is not the active form of the thyroid hormone, T4. It has to be converted to T3. So keep this in mind, these are very important information tables. Most cells that we understand in the body have receptors for multiple hormone types at any one moment in time. And these can change as time passes too as the cells become mature or during different times of the day. So keep that in mind. So based on that, hormones may have a, an effect on a cell that is synergistic, permissive, or antagonistic. And we need to learn these three, and we'll do that in the next few slides. How a cell then responds depends on the amount and the combination of all the hormones that it interacts with at that moment in time. So looking at the word synergistic, synergistic simply means helping or combining. And both of these can be the effect of hormone interaction. So working together, they produce a particular effect. So additive is easy. If one hormone has a two effect on the cell and the other hormone has a two effect on the cell, then the two, if they arrive together, will have a four effect on the cell. So its additive is mathematical. It doesn't always have to add up to four. It can add up to three and a half sometimes or five. But regardless, uh, both hormones interact and produce the same type of effect. And the more hormone of that category there is, the bigger the effect. So that's called additive synergistic effect. There's a complementary synergistic effect too. In this case, one hormone activates one pathway, the other hormone activates a different pathway, and both pathways together produce the end result. And a perfect example of that is producing milk. So that requires estrogen, prolactin, and oxytocin all to be present at one time. The permissive effects of hormones can be looked at as a product. So one hormone alone may have a, a, a two-factor effect on the cell. The second hormone may have a one-factor effect on the cell. But if both are present, you may get a ten-factor effect on the cell. So one hormone makes the target cell more responsive to a second hormone. For instance, that's given here that the existence of parathyroid hormone makes the cells, certain cells of the intestine, 
more responsive to vitamin D3 in absorbing calcium. The third type of effect is antagonistic, when one hormone works in the opposite direction to the other. So and a great example of that is to look at insulin and glucagon. Both affect glucose levels in the blood, but one raises them and one reduces them. Glucagon raises them and insulin reduces them. Figure 11.10 shows us the example of thyroid hormone and epinephrine working in some form of cooperation. So if these were additive and they had the type of effect known as a synergistic, then the total would be around about here. But because it's way up here, this is a type of permissive effect. The number of receptors of a particular type that a cell has is not fixed. It can be adjusted to suit certain conditions. An increase in the number of receptors is called upregulation, and likewise, a decrease in the number of total receptors on a cell is called downregulation. The administration of large quantities of a hormone or something that looks like a hormone can have weird effects on the outcome of our physiology. In fact, uh, the taking of pharmaceutical or illicit drugs can cause uncommon outcomes. And these pharmaceutical effects can also occur in diseases involving the secretion of excessive amounts of hormones by the producing cells. What tells the producing cells how much hormone to release? The answer is hormones coming from other places can tell that cell what to do. Neurotransmitters impinging on that cell can tell that cell what to do. And the concentration of ions or nutrients can tell that cell what to do. So that endocrine cell is a detector. The goal of most systems within the body is to maintain a set value, as we saw in chapter one. That set value normally results in a negative feedback loop that goes back to the original sensors and reports what's going on. So in this example, we have an increase in glucose concentration in the blood that then influences the insulin secreting cells of the pancreas, which release insulin in response to detecting that increased glucose concentration. That increased plasma insulin then has an impact on the target cells, which increase the transport of glucose into their cells. And that causes the plasma concentration then to be brought back down. The four general ways in which the nervous system can talk to the hormonal system is indicated in figure 11.13. The autonomic nervous system has two ways in which it interacts. The first is by direct interaction. The neuron leaves the central nervous system and then synapses with cells in the adrenal gland in this particular example. And they have a positive impact on those cells, causing them to release hormone into the bloodstream, in this case, epinephrine. In a different architecture, there's a ganglion outside the central nervous system in the peripheral nervous system. So these are gonna be talked about in other chapters, so realize what they are. Uh, ganglion is simply a synapse outside the central nervous system between neurons on an efferent pathway. So the second order neuron there uh, it can have a, either a positive or negative outcome on the endocrine gland, causing it either to release more hormone or no hormone. So that's the architecture that we find in the autonomic nervous system. There's some special cases too, and the hypothalamus is that special case. The hypothalamus has two architectures. The connection between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary looks like this. So the neurons are still part of the central nervous system and they release their own hormones which travel through the blood to the anterior pituitary where they can have a positive or negative outcome depending on the hormone. The pituitary in return releases its own hormones which then go and impact the target cells. The posterior pituitary is a weird structure. There, the cell body is in the central nervous system, and technically the exon is still in the central nervous system, 
but it impinges on the posterior pituitary as an extension of the central nervous system. And these neurons simply release their contents, which are hormones that travel directly to the target cells. Something strange. As we just saw, some hormones trigger other cells to release other hormones. In this case, there's a special name for these prior hormones. They're called tropic hormones. So a hormone that controls the secretion of another hormone is a tropic hormone. Let's look at some disorders of the endocrine system. Some terminology is very important to understand. Let's go through it very quickly. Hypo means not enough. Hyposecretion is the secretion of too little hormone. Hypersecretion is the secretion of too much hormone. So keep that terminology in your minds as we go and look at some further diseases in a few moments. Hyporesponsiveness refers to a decreased responsiveness of the target cells to that hormone. For instance, in a case of insulin, uh, diabetes. Hyperresponsiveness is an increased responsiveness to the, the hormone by the target cell. One of the best ways to understand all these relationships is to look at the pituitary. The pituitary gland is located just below the brain in a extension called the bulb. And within that bulb, we have the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. And it sits in a groove inside a bone at the back of the nasal cavity. Keeping this architecture in your mind at all times when referring back to the pituitary gland is very important. You'll notice that there's a private set of capillaries here that then deteriorate into arterioles before reforming capillaries once again and then joining the general circulation. So this is called a private blood supply between two capillary beds. And whenever you have that, it's called a portal system. So because it goes from the extension of the hypothalamus here, the blood supply, to the pituitary, it's called the hypothalamo hypophysial portal system. It is only present in the tissue feeding the anterior pituitary. The portal system does not, does not have any influence on the posterior pituitary. This is very, very important. The cell bodies of the neurons that feed the posterior pituitary is simply the architecture shown here. So the green structures have their cell bodies, their nuclei, in these centers and their exons are then elongated and they terminate on the surface of the capillary bed in the posterior pituitary. The neurons, on the other hand, it's 21 hours. The neurons, on the other hand, that feed the anterior pituitary, their termini are located here in the capillary bed at the base of the hypothalamus. So they don't extend into this tissue here. Instead, the release of contents by these purple structures is a tropic hormone that travels this short distance, this tiny distance down this private supply to these capillaries in the anterior pituitary, then influences the cells in here to release their hormones. This is one of the most important structural organizations of the pituitary. Reference back to this figure and its two diagrams should be now clear with respect to the anatomy of the pituitary. So please try to draw this out yourselves. In physiology, whenever a structure is strung and hanging below another structure through some type of stalk, that structure is called an infundibulum. The interior mass of the pituitary is known as the adeno hypophysis and the posterior lobe of the pituitary is known as the neurohypophysis. This tells us that the posterior lobe is an extension of the neurons coming out of the hypothalamus. So the anterior pituitary is glandular epithelial with two parts, the pars distalis and the pars tuberalis, whilst the entire posterior pituitary is the pars nervosa. The anatomy and these terms are better illustrated by this figure. 
the only precaution is to look at the pars intermedia, which is only present in the fetus, and then it disappears. The posterior pituitary is easier to correlate with, so let's start there. It produces just two types of hormones. The ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which promotes the retention of water in the kidneys, also known as vasopressin, and oxytocin, which is a hormone that has something to do with reproduction and birth, so it mainly influences women. In this particular case, it stimulates contractions in childbirth, and thereafter the milk letdown response in lactation. Let's reiterate one last time. The posterior pituitary tissue is not tissue in its own right, it's just an extension of the hypothalamus. Therefore, the posterior pituitary does not synthesize anything because it has no cell bodies. It's just the terminal exons and their butons that are present in that location. So the oxytocin and the ADH are actually produced in the hypothalamus and then transported down through the microtubules of the exon to the buton. So where exactly are the cell bodies that actually produce these two hormones? Well, ADH and oxytocin are produced by the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus, respectively. These substances are then transported in the inside of the exon through the region encompassing the hypothalamo hypophysial tract. So this is important. This is called a tract. It's not called blood vessels. That would be different. That would be the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary has a tract that it follows. And these uh, substances are then stored in the buton at the terminal ends, which are located in the posterior pituitary. ADH is released in response to blood osmolarity as detected by the supraoptic cell bodies in the hypothalamus. Oxytocin, on the other hand, is stimulated by suckling. So the receptors in the nipples then are tracked to the hypothalamus and there they interact with the uh, paraventricular nuclei. This figure makes all that more apparent. In this figure we can see the anterior pituitary and its connection through the stalk. Here we have the hypothalamo-hypophysial portal vessels and not a tract. The anterior pituitary architecturally is simpler but more complex in the number of cells that are interacting with the hormones in the private blood supply. The hormones released by the anterior pituitary are tropic hormones because they will now go to other glands throughout the body and influence their secretion of hormone. There are six hormones to remember. Let's go through the list. So the first one is ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone. Its target is the circumference or the cortex of the adrenal gland where it stimulates the secretion of glucocorticoids. The second one is TSH. H, thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, it interacts on the thyroid, causing the thyroid to secrete thyroid hormone. The third hormone is growth hormone that affects most tissues throughout the body, promoting protein synthesis and other types of activities associated with liberating energy. The next one is prolactin, PRL, which affects the mammary glands and other sex accessory organs. Likewise, FSH is the follicle stimulating hormone that affects the gonads and that promotes gamete production. And then we have luteinizing hormone that's normally responsible for influencing the state of the ovary as we'll see in the chapter on reproduction. But it also stimulates testosterone secretion in males. The same information is conveyed by figure 1116 and 1118 from the textbook. So study either one and come to the same conclusions. With respect to feedback, we have negative feedback inhibition. In the case of the final product coming back and then telling the hypothalamus and the pituitary what to produce and what not to produce. This three-tiered relationship between the hypothalamus, 
the anterior pituitary, and the target tissue is called an axis. The feedback mechanism, the feedback loop, may impinge directly on the pituitary, thereby modulating the impact of the hypothalamus on this region, or the feedback loops can go further up into the hypothalamus and directly inhibit secretion of the releasing hormones. That relationship is nicely illustrated in this slide, where we can see that the negative feedback can take place at two levels, one or the other or both. The last thing we need to remember is the short loop, long loop feedback systems. So a short loop simply has a relationship between the hormone that's released by the anterior pituitary coming back and talking directly to the hypothalamus. And a long loop is where the third endocrine gland in the sequence releases its hormone and that comes back and talks either to the pituitary or the hypothalamus.